habis Hadi everyone. Let's try that one more time. Hadi God is good. And all the time. We are experiencing a shaking. You believe that? But it's nothing new. It was prophesied. It must take place. Because the church must be purified. Amen. Thank you for allowing me to be in the midst of you on this beautiful Sabbath day to worship God with you. Before we begin our study this morning, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father God, which art in heaven. Uh, Father, we can feel we can see and we can even hear uh, that we are indeed living living in the last days uh, we as a people have been experiencing a big shaking in our midst uh, some will be shaken out and others will be shaken in i pray father for not only myself but for everyone here that as we, just like Noah, experience the shaking, but we will find ourselves in the ark, in the arms of Jesus Christ, so that we will not be shaken out. We pray that you will take over every thought, every word that proceeds out of this mortal man's mouth, so that you may be glorified. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. For those of you who were among us yesterday, last night, uh, we looked at a passage which is found, I would like to take you there by the way, which is found in the book of Matthew chapter 9. Which book we're heading to? Matthew chapter 9. And what is, based on what we studied last night, what is our primary mission before the passing of the National Sunday Law? What is our primary mission? Once again, primarily mission before the passing of the National Sunday Law. That mission, we read about it in Matthew 10, in many other passages. Our primary mission is to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Just like Christ himself came into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he sent the disciples as well, primarily to the lost sheep. Of the house of Israel. In other words, what Christ did, he divided the church. I'm going to repeat that one more time. Christ divided the church. What did Christ do? He divided the church. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? You don't know how to answer that. Now, who did the dividing? The, 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 who caused the division? It was Christ. So my question again was, was that a good thing or was that a bad thing? Obviously, if Christ did it, it was a good thing. Amen? It was a good thing. The church needed that division at the time. And in this study, we are going to deal partly with what is known to us the parable of the wheat and the tares. But let me begin in 9 as we studied last night. I'm going to take you all the way down to verse 37. And the Bible says, Then saith Jesus unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, 
the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, when we read about a harvest, automatically, one of the first things that comes to your mind is something has been sowed, right? Somebody, somewhere, planted something. And it is coming to a point when it's going to, based on the fruit that it produced, it's going to be ready for the harvest, as Jesus said this. Now my question for you is, where was this harvest that Jesus mentioned here in John chapter 10? Where was this harvest that was getting ready to be harvested? Where was that? Was that harvest in the world or was it in the church? In the church, Christ saw that there were lost sheep and he wanted to gather them, lost sheep within the church. He wanted to gather them and he knew that many based on seeds that were planted before, he knew that many within the church would receive the message. And that message will cause a, a shaking in the church and many within the church would receive the message. Now I'm going to take you to a very familiar passage that I am sure all of you here, whether young or old, are very familiar with. And this is found in the book of Revelation chapter 14. We're going to read the third angel's message. And I'm going to read the entire third angel's message. And then we're going to talk about it. Beginning in verse 9. The Bible says in verse 9, Revelation chapter 14. How does it begin? And I saw. Are you there? What was the message? Or the warning, I should say. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. Yes, that sounds very similar to the fourth angel. The fourth angel came down with a loud voice as well. With a loud voice, saying, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And then it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. That is the third angel's message. Now I am going to ask a question because I know that you are very well acquainted with this passage that we just read from chapter 14 of the Revelation, verses 9 through 14. I know that you know the answer, or I sh let me back up. You should know the answer. And here's the question. Primarily, who is this passage addressing here? Who is the main target? Who must receive this warning primarily? Which church? The Seven Adventist Church. Now, the passage is dealing with what? Can you tell me what the passage is dealing with? Verses 9 through 11, or all the way down to 12, but especially 9 through 11. It's dealing with the mark of the beast and what else? The image of the beast and worship, right? Mark of the beast, image of the beast, and uh, worship. 
Now, did God, I, I'd like for you to keep that in mind. Did God give us the foundation of the truth and worship? Yes, he did. Did you know, brothers and sisters, many of us, we have read this passage, we've heard sermons about this passage, and we always apply it to Babylon, right? To those who are in the world. But did you know that this passage is connected, is primal, primarily a warning to Seventh-day Adventists? It is primarily a warning to you and I. And that passage is connected also with the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now, let me take you to Luke chapter 3. Where are we heading to? Luke chapter 3. And let's begin in verse 17. Luke chapter 3. Where are we heading to, saints? Notice carefully in Luke chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 17, we read, this is John the Baptist speaking here. As a matter of fact, let me back up to verse 15. And as people were in expectation or and all men of muse in their hearts of John, that is John the Baptist, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered saying unto them, all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will do what? Thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the what? The wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Now, put a finger of a bookmark here to this passage here. Go back to Revelation chapter 14. Now, let's read the following verse that comes after verse 14. Oh, I'm sorry, that comes after verse 12, rather. Remember what verse 12 says. Verse 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that do what? Keep the commandments of God. And what else? And they have the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, based on what we just read in Luke chapter 3 there, verse 17, speaking of John the Baptist. Remember those words that John the Baptist used. What do we find here in verse 13 of Revelation 14? We read and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, hence from henceforth. Yea, serve the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man, having what? What are the words? On his head a golden crown and what else? And in his hand a what? Sharp Sickle. What do you do with a sharp sickle? You whip what? Obviously, there was a harvest. Now, one more time. Remember, I said keep a finger or a bookmark in John chapter 3. Notice the same language. Oh, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 3. Notice the same language or the similar language that we find as well in Luke chapter 3. Now, keep in mind, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ, wasn't he? Talk to me now. John the Baptist was what? The forerunner of Jesus Christ. Now, before the second advent of Jesus Christ, there must also be some forerunners. And uh, the Bible described them as 144,000. Notice, let's go back again to Luke chapter 3. Verse 17 again, whose fan, that is Christ's fan, is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. So, John the Baptist was referring to a harvest 
in his days that Christ was coming to harvest. But this was a twofold prophecy as well. It met an application primarily in the days of John. But there is a secondary action to that passage when Christ, based on what we just read in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14, when Christ comes again the second time. But where the question is, was that harvest that John the Baptist was referring to. Where was that harvest? The day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. Very good. Somebody said it. The day of Pentecost. Now, the next question is, where, among whom, was that harvest found? Among whom? Was it among the Gentiles? No, it was among the house of Israel. Now, keep in mind what Jesus also said in John 10. Go not in the ways of the whom? The Samaritan or the Gentiles, but rather go to the lost sheep. That's John chapter 10. To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, as we stated last night, for every generation, there is present truth for that generation. To prepare that generation, to prepare the church for the crisis that is at hand. Or a crisis that is about to come. Just like Christ, God raised John the Baptist with present truth. And what was the present truth? Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. He was also calling the people to repentance. He also prophesied of a harvest that was almost ready to be harvested among the children of Israel. Now keep in mind the words harvest. Keep in mind also the word wheat. Go to chapter 13 this time of the book of Matthew. Where are we heading to? Chapter 13 of the book of Matthew. And I hope and pray that you are wide awake and the heat is not putting you to sleep. Notice in chapter 13, of the book of Matthew. Are you there saints? And the Bible tells us. In verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them. Saying the kingdom of heaven. Is likened unto a man. Which does what? Sowed good seed. In his field. But while men slept. What happened? His enemy came. And sowed tares. Among the wheat. I, I lost Mike here. Let's try the other one. Mike? We lost Mike. Can we bring that back up? Can we bring the mic back up? And also the screen there. Can you fix the screen? We lost the screen as well. All right. So let's continue to read. Can you hear me? I'm going to try my voice here without the mic. Again, it says in verse 25, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared what appeared? The tares. Now, this parable is referring to the great controversy that started way back in heaven, but has been playing on this earth ever since the fall of Adam and Eve. Uh, okay, thank you. We got the mic sound by. Let's, uh, let's bring this back on the screen. Thank you very much. So this controversy ever since the creation of men, the fall of Adam and Eve, we have seen and been experiencing this controversy. God built a garden, created a garden. He planted good seed in the garden. But the enemy came, the Bible says, he sowed tares, he planted tares. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it up tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Will thou then that we go and do what? 
gather up them up, but he said, Nay, lest while we gather up the stairs, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both do what? Grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest, I will do what? I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together, thrust the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into the barn. This parable has been used over and over and over again to cause Seventh-day Adventists to believe, to think that you cannot separate yourselves from the conference. This has been misused by our leaders so that we would not Yield and understand present truth for this time. I'm going to let my uh, young men here to fix this uh, issue that we... Uh, this is the tech guy here. Young men, how old are you? 10. Huh? 10. 10. 10 years old? 13. Oh, 13 years old. I was going to say, you, my man, you look really, really young for 13 years old. We thank God for young people. Amen. That are working for the Lord and helping to bring also present truth to the forefront. In spite of the technical difficulties, God is in control, amen? So, as I was saying, we have heard this passage being used so often, so many times before, to say, to tell us that we must stay with the boat. Now, did you know that staying with the boat, meaning you will never know and understand the signs of the times present truth for this time. John the Baptist mentioned a separation in the passage that we read a moment ago. He mentioned a separation based on the signs of the times, based on an harvest that God had, but you could not see the harvest, you could not find the harvest, unless there was somebody that God would raise up with a message that would shake the church and separate the wheat from the tares. You see, it is not our job, physically speaking, to separate the wheat from the tear, but it is the message that does the separation. I'm glad you say amen, because it is true. It is the what? The message. Now, in order for the message to cause that separation, there has to be somebody who is sent with the message to cause that shaking to happen. Now, by the way, that shaking is not just happening among conference churches, but even among present truths. Among self-supporting. You got it? Let's go back. All right. So this shaking is not just happening among the conference churches, but also among present truth. It is what must cause a shaking, a purification within the church from both conference and non-conference alike. And as you have heard and been hearing what has been going on, I think it's coming on, You'll be able to take it from here, right? Wait, hold on a second. Yep, it's coming. Let's pull that. Okay. All right, you got it now? 
We're sorry about the uh, interruption. And I hope somebody is praying to get this back online as he's trying his best to bring it back on. So we must experience a shaking and that shaking produces a harvest. And that harvest will bring about what the Bible describes as the first fruits. What does the, the Bible calls it? The first fruit, meaning a purification will take place within the church and God will have then a purified church ready to present, to proclaim the love pride message to the world. But as we are told, judgment must begin first in the house of Israel. That part of judgment also purifies the church. Is it back on over there? Not yet. Can we just do it on the screen there? Can we just do it on the screen? Just control it on the screen. Is it going over there? Yeah, let's cancel this one. Is that on over there? It's not on? All right. Okay. So let's just leave that alone. Let me just read for you what you cannot see on the screen. We're just going to try to see if you can look it up on the screen here. Just change it from over there. Okay. Now, let me recap. We've had a distraction here. Let me recap. Remember Revelation chapter 14, third angel's message we just read about. Ask the question earlier. We read that passage so often that deals with the mark of the beast and the image of the beast and worship. But how often have you heard that that message found in the third angel's message? Also, the warning, as Sister White says, the greatest warning ever given unto men is for seven day Adventists first. Let me read something for you here on the screen. This is from early writing 118. She says, I then saw the third angel. Which message did she see? Now keep in mind, an angel from the Greek represents what? The Greek word is what? Angelos, which means a messenger, right? Are you with me? It's a messenger. So what did she see? She saw the third angel. Now keep in mind what we just read from Revelation 14, 9 through 11 about the third angel. She said, I then saw the third angel, said my accompanying angel, fearful is his work, awful is his mission, he is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares and seal of the wheat from the heavenly garner. These things should engross the whole mind, the whole attention. What? She says the third angel, the third angel's message is to do his work. Is the angel that is to select Keyword, that angel must select the wheat from among the tares. Wait, is it a literal angel that God is sending? No. Let's go back again. It is that angel, that message that must do what? Cause that shaking, cause that separation, the wheat from the tares. You see the application here. So now, let me go back to the point I made earlier. How often have we read and heard Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 to 11? We only hear the application 
with the beast, with the mark of the beast. But did you know that it is for us? Now, we have that on the screen over there. Do we have it there? It's there now. Can you see it over there? Now, let me reread it since we have it on the screen there. Then saw the third angel, said my accompanying angel, fearful is his work, is his mission. He is the third uh, the angel. That is to select the wheat from the tares. And what else? What comes next? Seal or bind the wheat from the heavenly garner. Now, that message does what? It does three things. Now, keep in mind, what she's referring to here is among us as a church. It will do three things among us as a church, as a people. It will do what? What's the first one? It will do, come on, talk to me now. What's the first one? It will separate the wheat from the tares. Now, question for you. The separation of the wheat and the tares is not dealing with the world. Oh. Is that dealing with the world? No. This is dealing with the church. What is the second thing it will do? It will seal. And the third thing is it will... Now, what does sealing mean? What does sealing mean? Uh, that means a people, the wheat, have been separated from the tares. And now, God will have a purified church. Remember, we read in the parable that the tares came from whom? The Satan. The tares came from Satan. God, from among his church, must separate the wheat from the tares and the first separation is being done by the proclamation of the message. And then as we read earlier from Revelation 14, 14, the second, the last separation, which will be the physical one, will be done by the second coming of Jesus Christ. But the message, just like John the Baptist, must separate the church first. Just like John did in his days. Now, I'm going to read another passage for you, found in Manuscript Willis's 17. And page 17 as well. A new life is coming from heaven and taking possession of God's people. But divisions will come in the church. Two parties will be developed. And then she says, the wheat and the tares grow up together for the harvest. Now, here is the key here. If I were to ask you this question, which harvest is she referring to, and even the Bible referring to? Which harvest? Did you know that there are two harvests? Did you know that there are two harvests? I just read for you that the third angel message will separate the wheat from the tares, and it will seal a people, and it will bind the ones that are sealed. Meaning they will, they are going to send on the truth. Now we read that a new light is coming from heaven and taking possession of God's church, God's people. Divisions will come in the church. Two parties will be developed. The wheat and the test grow together. Question for you. And I would like for you to talk to me. Which harvest she's referring to here? And another question is, when is that harvest? I believe that question is even more important than the first. When is that harvest? When will that take place? Somebody said when the church is purified, purified who else? I can't really hear you. Okay. Now, let's get put this into perspective, into its context. Which passage that we are dealing with primarily that is also addressing because of the mark of the beast, because of the image of the beast, and worshipping God on a false day, 
that the wheat and the tares must be separated. Which passage is that? That is Revelation 14, third angel's message. Now notice where that harvest is. Listen to what she says here on the screen. She says, the tares and the wheat are to grow together until, she repeats that, until when again? The harvest. And then she says, and the harvest, now this is the explanation. And the harvest is when? The end of probationary time. Question for you now. Which probation? Because there are two probations. Which probation that she's referring to? For the church. Remember, wheat and tares. That's the context. Remember, she kept mentioning wheat and tares. The parable of the wheat and the, and the tares is not dealing with the world. No, no, that's not dealing with the world. That is dealing with the church. So, which probation she's referring to here? It's the church. So again, the tares and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest. And the harvest is the end of probationary time. So there is a harvest in Israel, brothers and sisters. There is a harvest. But the end of probationary time, what time is that? Based on Bible prophecy. The Sunday law. It's the Sunday law. Oh, God will must have a people ready by the time the Sunday law is enacted. He must have a harvest. Few church ready for the loud cry. Which is also known based Acts chapter 3 as the refreshing. He must have a people ready prepared for that harvest. And it's coming. It's coming. Let me spend a little time here in Acts chapter 3. Notice carefully with me. That is the refreshing. As I mentioned a moment ago. We need that refreshing brothers and sisters. Amen. We don't we don't we need it? Yes, brothers and sisters, we need that refreshing. Listen carefully, speaking of the refreshing. Remember, they were preaching in Israel. Present truth in the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel. Notice again, addressing whom? Israel. Why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers have glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Question for you brothers and sisters. Based on what Jesus, or I'm sorry, Peter just said here. You deny him before Pilate when Pilate was willing to let him go. Revelation chapter 13 and 14. Well, let me go back since we're dealing with chapter 14. One of the warnings that we read about in chapter 14 is in regard to the image of the beast. What is the image of the beast? Speak up, please. Church and state, very good. Most of the time when I ask this question, somebody said the mark of the beast. No. Uh, or Sunday sacredness. The, no, it's different. It's church and state. What came together to prosecute Christ? Church and state. Peter just said this here. He said they gathered together with Pontius Pilate. They, that is the religious leaders. They created the image of the beast to persecute Christ. Listen carefully. But he denied the Holy One and just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and kill the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead. Whereof we are witnesses and his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him have given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I want that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But 
those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. And then what's the appeal to the house of Israel? Repent ye therefore and be what? Wait, does that mean there are some in the church that needs conversion? Then he goes on to say, that your sins be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. What is the time of refreshing? Thank you. That is the same time as the probationary time. That is the same time as the Sunday law. That is the same time as the loud cried message. That is the same time when the 144,000 will be fully sealed. That is the same time this is referring to him. That's the refreshing. And uh, as we read, that is also the same time that that harvest will be ready. But the message, just like the message of John the Baptist, must shake the church to prepare the church for the harvest. To prepare the wheat for the harvest. What is the next crisis that will determine this? It's a national Sunday law. That is the next crisis that will determine this. And as the leaders fell the first crisis, and as I mentioned yesterday, the pestilence crisis that God allowed to come upon the church and the world, it was not for the leadership of seven Adventists. It was for the members because the leadership has been in apostasy long, long, long ago. God was shaking the members, was shaking the church to see if they will go along with the leadership telling them to follow the science. Did you know, brothers and sisters, that now they are telling us, based on climate change, which again calls for Sunday law, they are telling us the same thing to also follow the science. Let me take you back to the screen. Notice this headline. We read from Fox News. The View, co-host, Sunny hosting blames eclipse. Remember the eclipse that just took place? Remember that? Back in uh, Monday, I believe it was. And then it says eclipse. Quick, sick of us. On climate change, the view co-host Sunny Hosting blend Monday's solar eclipse, Friday's earthquake, and the expecting cicada breeding season on what? Climate change. All those things together would maybe lead one to believe that either climate change exists or something is really going on. So if you have a call today, it's because of climate change. Just like during the pestilence crisis, somebody died of a car accident, a motorcycle accident, and uh, the diagnosis said, uh, the claim was, it was the pestilence that killed him. Even though it was from a car accident. So everything today has to do with uh, climate change. And what will be the next thing they will be calling for on the screen? I want to go a little faster here. Don't want to take you to... Take too much time here. The Sunday way. This says support the whole ecosystem for a beautiful lawn that's full of life. Join your Sunday neighborhood. Check out how many of your neighbors are already making an impact. Every home that switches to Sunday helps make your neighborhood a better place for whom? For people, pets, and what else? And planet. While your neighbors are switching to Sunday, you don't have to spend hours researching. We do the plant. And what's the next word? Science stuff for you. Hey, those same scientists now are telling us Sunday is the solution. Let's move on. Next on the screen. This website said, this was from April 7th, 2024. Slow Sunday challenge. It's hard for some people to get into the lifestyle routine of picking and keeping to a weekly Earth Sabbath day. So, what better way than taking a slow Sunday challenge for two months 
and start by just slowing down. Take the challenge and I'm sure you'll start to see the, what's the word? Benefits and joys of keeping a weekly Earth Sabbath day. Now, brothers and sisters, I would like for you to prayerfully think about those things that we are reading about. On the surface, it seems very innocent. But what they are calling an Earth Sabbath is what the Bible refers to based on Revelation 14. If any man worship the beast, receive his mark in his forehead. That is the mark of the beast we are reading about here. Earth Sabbath is a counterfeit Sabbath. Earth Sabbath, as Daniel 7.25 says, he shall think to change times and law. Earth Sabbath replaces the Sabbath of Jehovah. And there will be penalty, penalties for not observing the earth Sabbath, which will be Sunday, by the way. Notice what Spirit Prophecy tells us here. Now, this is where the great controversy comes to us. As the controversy extends into new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan's Satan is a stir, the power attending the message only maddens those who oppose it. The clergy, now, clergy, that would be the pastors, right? The clergy put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light, lest it should shine upon whom? Upon their flocks, by every means at their command. They endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, papists are solicited to come to the help home of Protestants. Hey, what's what's happening? We have something else playing here. Can we turn that off? Why am I hearing myself on another screen here speaking? Thank you very much. Now, I would like for you to focus on what I just read. We got distracted here for a moment. What we just read, the question for you is, whom is she referring to here? Yeah. Whom is being addressed here? Now, one more time. For those of you who, cannot, who are sitting on that side, perhaps you cannot see the screen very well. Let me reread that for you. And try now to pay attention to the words. Are you with me now? It says, as the great controversy or the controversy extends into new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message only maddens those who oppose it. The clergy, that is the pastors or the leadership, put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light, lest it should shine upon their flocks by every means. At their command, they endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, papists are solicited to come to the help of Protestants. The church, it says, appeals to the strong arm of civil power. What is civil power? That is the state. What is the state? Did you know that is primarily referring to our church? You didn't know that. It is primarily referring to Seventh-day Adventist leadership. They appeal to civil power. You, do you want an example of that? How? In light of climate change, for example, in light of the president's crisis, didn't the church appeal to civil power? Didn't our leadership receive millions, if not billions of dollars from the civil power? Yes. And because they made an alliance, a partnership with civil authority, civil power, how did they coerce us? 
to take the poison. They said, we will not give you religious exemption. And it is part of our health message. Are they doing the same thing for climate change? Are they appealing to civil power as well to do something about climate change? Here's an example of that. And I quoted this before. This is from the General Conference website. The dangers of what? Climate change. Despite the clear risks, governments appear slow to act. The world membership of the seven Adventist Church requests that who the government's concern take steps necessary to avert the danger of climate change by fulfilling the agreement which in Rio de Janeiro 1992 Convention on Climate Change. For what reason? To stabilize carbon dioxide emissions by the year 2000 at 1990. Now this was written way back in 1995. And the Seventh-day Adventist General Conference, just like the United Nations, the media, and the government, way back then, they were promoting this lie that came from Rome that if we don't do something about climate change, reduce population. How many of you are old enough to remember Y2K? Yes. Remember Y2K? They said by the year 2000, the earth was going to be destroyed by climate change. Wait, this is 24 years later now. We are still here. So, we see the leadership reach out to the government and telling the government to take action to combat climate change, even saying to stabilize carbon dioxide emissions. Question for you. How do you stabilize carbon dioxide emissions? What is the best way to do that? Reduce the population. Reduce the population. Now, this is well documented. N notice another one. Ventus and environment preservation drives. We invite everyone to join us in this important endeavor and be part of the environmental safeguarding and climate action. Those words came straight from Rome. Do you see why the message of Revelation 14, third and fourth message, is first for us to separate the wheat from the tares because the warning is if any man or woman worships the beast, and his image, what will happen to that person? And we see this mark on his forehead. What would happen? The same shall drink of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented day and night. The message is first for us, brothers and sisters. Because Sister White says, the third angel's message separate the wheat from the tares. And that is what we read in the third angel's message. And this is some of the examples of why that message must separate God's people. That God must have a true harvest because we cannot go along with this. Another one on the screen. Adventist youth make global impact on youth day. Notice what our youth are being taught. Show up in the cities. Adventist youth from all corners of the globe embark on a transformative journey as they participated in the annual Global Youth Day under the rallying cry, show up to the cities, in the cities, recognizing the importance of what? Environmental stewardship. Who told us to do this? That is a kid. Have you ever heard of Laudato Sea Movement? They are doing the same thing from city to city. Educating people to be better stewards of the planet. To safeguard the environment. Meanwhile, they are using Laudato Si, which calls for what? Sunday sacredness. On how to do it. Back to the screen, it goes on to say, Adventist youth are also encouraged to undertake nature conservation projects promoting sustainability through activities like tree planting and pollution awareness campaigns. 
Somebody might say, well, what's wrong with uh, tree planting? There's nothing wrong with that. But if you are doing it because of what the Pope says in Laudato Si, now there's something wrong with it. Notice what Spirit of Prophecy went on to tell us. Listen to this passage here. The tares. Remember, we're dealing with the wheat and the tares, right? The tares represent a class who are the fruit or embodiment of what? Ooh, what is that, sisters? Let me ask you a question. Based on scripture, what is error? What is error based on scripture? False teachings, false doctrines. So who are the tares? The tares would be those who have told us that the Babylonian poison is part of our health message. Right? The error would be climate change, promoting climate change to be to safeguard the environment. Let's continue. The tares represent a class who are the fruit or embodiment of error, of false principles. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Neither God nor his angels ever sowed a seed that would produce a tear. The tares are always sown by whom? Satan, the enemy of God, and man. So now we know based on what the Bible says in Spirit of Prophecy that we have uh, tares among us and Satan is the one who planted them and we know we found a shot of a doubt now that the third angel's message must separate the wheat from among the tares. Right? Here's another reason. This says Catholic Christian Groups share faith-driven plan for climate adaptation with Congress. So who's behind this whole climate hoax? The Roman Catholic, the Pope. At the event sponsored by Catholic Relief Services, the offices of Sins, Bill Cassidy, and Tim Kaine, those are head of states or politicians, National Latino Evangelical Coalition, National Association of Evangelicals, Evangelical Environmental Network, Laudato C Movement, Kingdom Mission Society, Catholic Climate Covenant, what else? Jesuit Conference Office of Justice and Ecology, World Relief and World Vision, participants discuss the need to help vulnerable communities adapt to changes in climate. Who's behind the whole climate hoax? The Jesuits. Question for you. Who are the Jesuits? Who are the Jesuits? Based on history, who are they? Have you ever heard of the Counter-Reformation? The Jesuits institution came up with preterism, futurism to counteract the Bible. And that is one of the reasons why as well, by the way, how many of you here have a Bible? How many of you here have a Bible with you? So many of you have a Bible. What kind of Bible do you have? Is, is that a consensus? The, the majority? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. King James, did you know that all the other Bibles are counterfeit? They are also part of the counter-reformation. When you go to many of our churches, what kind of Bibles do you find? Those Bibles are full with errors. They're full with errors. And what kind of Bible is the King James Version of the Bible? What kind of Bible? It's the Protestant Bible. Now, let me ask you another question. Where did they get the original version of the Bible to give us the King James Bible? Do you know that history? I did a research. I, have, I was doing a study on Trinity versus Inter-Trinity. And then I came across this based on my research. Did you know that the King James Bible, the, those who gave us the King James Bible, 
they used the Waldensian's Bible to give us the King James Bible. And Sister White says, the Waldensian's faith came straight from the apostles. Ah, brothers and sisters, put that together. They used the Waldensian's Bible to give us the King James Bible. And who are the Waldensians? True Protestants. They kept the Sabbath as well. At least the majority of them. They kept the Sabbath. And they were hated by Pope Free. That's a Bible we must have in our hands today. You cannot expose Pope Free. You cannot defend even the Adventist faith in another Bible. Did you know that? You cannot defend what we believe as seven Adventists from, by using another Bible. All of them are counterfeit. And especially the NIV. Especially the NIV. You go to many of our churches. You find those errors there. In our pulpit. In the back of our pulpit. I walk in seven, into several seven Adventist churches. And you will find NIV there. And in the NIV... Well, let's just say the NIV is half of the Bible. And that, even, that doesn't even count the mistranslation. The reason why I said it's half of the Bible, because many of some passages, like for example, in the book of Acts, chapter 8, this is the account of Stephen with the Ethiopian. Remember when the Ethiopian asked Stephen, what, uh, here's water, what would stop me from, uh, Philip, thank you, thank you, Philip, what would stop me from getting baptized? Hmm? What would stop, remember that, when he asked that question? Philip, thank you for the correction. What would stop me from getting baptized? What did Philip say to him? Please. If you believe, what? With all your heart, that what? Finish it. That Jesus is the Son of God and so on and so forth, right? In the NIV, that passage has been removed. <laughs> Turn to an NIV if you have one. It's not there. Yet, many of our people are being fed based on that rotten bread. The NIV and so many other translations. Yet, no protest, brothers and sisters. No protest. No protest. Let me finish here. Go back to the screen. This mentioned Jesuit Conference Office of Justice promoting climate change. Now, it is not something new what I'm about to share with you. It is well known among seven Adventists that we have had Jesuit infiltration among us. Many of our pastors, especially those within the conference, they are either Jesuits or they have attended a Jesuit school. Ted Wilson, for example, he attended one of them, Fordham University, and many others. And who remember who this man was? I said was because he died. Who remember who? Who, who knows? Who this man was? Do you know his name? Yeah. You wait. Nobody knows who that man. Who, who that is on the screen? That is Samuel Bakioki. Have you ever heard the name before? You need to know your history. That is Samuel Bakioki. Now look at the picture carefully. He has those three fingers. He's holding those three fingers like that. Do you know where that came from? That's pure paganism. Who was Samuel Bakyoki? He was one of the leaders within GC. He attended a Jesuit school. And look at what he's wearing. This was at his graduation from that Jesuit school. Now, if we zoom in, go to the next picture. This is what you find on his clothes. You see the IHS? Do you know what the IHS is? Huh? 
That's that's a symbol for the Jesuits. That's what is on his chest. His chest. Here is his Jesuit certificate from the University of Notice it says Begoniana. That's a Jesuit. And this man was one of the leaders among Seventh-day Adventists, teaching heresies among Seventh-day Adventists. Yes, he, he spoke some truth, but remember, one, if one percent of it is error, the whole thing is error. Again, his name was Samuel Bakyokis. Again, his graduation certificate, it's, it's out there. This is, you don't have to go into his personal life to find this. This is online. You will find it. And today, many of our pastors, I know because I was being pressured to do the same thing too. Many of our pastors today are being told they have to go back to the seminary. Let's say they have a uh, bachelor degree in theology, right? They are being told they have to go back to the seminary to get a master of divinity. You know why? Because doing that course, master of divinity, now you are being taught spiritual formation. It's the indoctrination that came from the Jesuits. Spiritual formation came from the Jesuits. Do you know, brothers and sisters, who was on board, on the board of Andrews University that approves spiritual formation to be taught at Andrews University? It was Ted Wilson. But in 2010, at his acceptance speech, he said, stay away from spiritual formation. When he was one of the leaders on the board of, at Andrews University who approved it. Do you know what year that was when they approved it? Can anybody here take a guess? I'm, I'm giving you some history here. Can anybody take a guess what year it was? Now, let me give you a clue. They say, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? Never let a good crisis go to waste. Now, that's a clue for you. Somebody says 2019, 2015, huh? 2020, okay. Now, come on. You should have done, you should have done the, ma the math already. Remember, he said in 2010 to stay away from sweet formation. Remember that? So that means he has to be fired. <laughs> that should be fired. Do you know, again, the clue was, never let a good crisis go to waste. You know when that was approved among us? Say it again. 9-11. 2001. 9-11. That's when it was approved. While everybody was looking over there, the leadership was doing something over that way. Yes, never let a good crisis go to waste. And many of us did not know what was happening because everybody around the world was focusing on 9-11. 9-11, while the government was taking away our freedom. Meanwhile, the church was bringing spiritual formation that came straight from the Jesuits to be taught at our university. Today, I know many pastors, some of them I'm friends with. Even recently, one of them, he had uh, three churches in the state of Oregon, in the US. He had three churches, but because he only had an MDiv, MDiv meaning Master of Divinity. By the way, how do you master God? Because the word divinity means, mean, right? God is divine. How do you master God? We have fallen into the policies of the We started having degrees when we were, I, I was, by the way, we were not supposed to have universities. I mentioned that last night. 
And uh, because we have been following the policies of the world, now we have uh, uh, BS, uh, uh, and we have uh, uh, Master of Divinity, we have uh, PhD, which stands for Permanent Head Damage. And all of those things came from the Jesuits, and we are being taught those things. Now, our pastors are being told that not only you need a Master of Divinity, you also need to go for your PhD. I know a pastor friend of mine. He already had a master of divinity, but the conference told him he had to go get a PhD. And he had to leave his three churches because that's how they indoctrinate you. And then he's going to come back to his church and breathe those Ignatius Loyola spirit upon the church. Let's move on. This article went on to say, the Catholic faith considers reason, including both philosophy and what else? Science as a crucial element in interpreting the scriptures to apply to the world today. Citing whom? For Francis' interpretation of Genesis in his encyclical on caring for creation, La Lato Si. Whom are they using? Whose interpretation, I should say, that the General Conference is using to promote climate change? The Pope interpretation, the Jesuits interpretation, the same way on the screen, those men use the same so-called science interpretation to coerce Seventh-day Adventists to take the Babylonian poison. All of them on the screen coerce you. They say, no, we will not give you a religious exemption. And then why took it? Paul got bit by a snake, so it's okay to take the snake shot. And many other lies we were told. And now we are being lied to accept climate change. What's coming? Sunday law, brothers and sisters. Listen to what Spirit of Prophecy says. The Lord has shown me clearly. Listen carefully. Now I want you to remember Revelation 14. Third angel's message we just read. Listen carefully. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed when? Before probation closes, pass. What did she says previously and also from the Bible about the probation? That time is what time? Which probation she's referring to here? Is it the, the remember two probations? There is the church's probation. And then there's the j close of probation. Which one she's referring to here? The church. That's seven day Adventists. At that time, the harvest will be ready to be right. Judgment must begin in the house of God, right? Probation closes for the church. National Sunday law is passed. And then the refreshing has come down the latter rain. And then what happened next? God has a few church at that time sealed, ready to preach Revelation 18. Say that again. Did you say John 10, 16? Yes. Can we read that? Let, let me read that. Thank you for that. Let me read what it says there. My brother then mentioned John 10, 10 16. Let's read what John 10, 16 says. Since we're having a Bible study, let's do that. Again, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now that passage, thank you, my brother, that passage is indeed referring to that time. The sheep that God would have, will have, that remains within seven Adventists, will now proclaim the message to the lost sheep, not now, no longer among the house of Israel, but the lost sheep that are out there in Babylon. And then they will come, and there shall be one fold, and one shepherd. Oh, what is that? The other time that will be. Let's continue back to the screen. For it is to be the great test. What is to be the great test? 
talk to me. No, not the Sabbath. What is to be the greatest for God's people? No, it's not Sunday law either. The image of the, let's let's reread it. Let me let me reread it. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast, not the mark of the beast, image. What is the image again? Church and state. The image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. Now, brothers and sisters, if the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, question for you, what time is it? Have we seen the image of the beast already? We've seen it already. When the church at large joined together with the state during the pestilence crisis, the image was formed. When the other religions joined with Pope and with the state to coerce others as well to accept the crisis and uh, the Babylonian poison, the image was formed. Now, as we see religious leaders along with Pope together with the state to promote climate change, Based on the Pope's interpretation of scripture, as we just read from the book of Genesis, that is the image of the beast. It has been formed. So don't wait for the close of probation to say it is closed. Because he said it will be formed when? Before the close of probation. Therefore, since this is based on Revelation 14 and the wheat and the tares, must be separated. That is the message, one of the messages that separates the wheat from the tares. Then God must have another Elijah, another John the Baptist to prepare the children of Israel to receive the seal of God. Let's continue. It goes on to say, this is based on Revelation chapter 13 verses 11 through 17. This is the test. That is the image of the beast is the test that the people of God must have before they are what? Sealed. Oh, brothers and sisters. The sealing takes place. The harvest in the house of Israel takes place. Probation takes place. Sunday law takes place. The loud cry takes place. The refreshing takes place. All of those six things took, will take place at the same time. And we are just a step away from all of those things being fulfilled. Just a stone away. That is the test for you. The test came upon the church, as I mentioned. The test was not for the leadership. It was for the members. The church, the test rather, came upon the, the church image of the beast. It came... And now we are awaiting the close of probation for the church, which will be as a result of the Sunday law. Go back to the screen. Let's finish that. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath, that is Sunday, will reign under the banner of the Lord Je God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. Do you know what this is also saying? Meaning the majority of seven Adventists and I hope none of us here will keep Sunday. The majority, wait, did somebody say amen? Okay. <laughs> Okay, I got I understand you. I understand. <laughs> no problem. The majority of seven Adventists will keep Sunday. This is not me saying spirit prophecy said the majority of seven Adventists we know today will be lost. Those are the sheep, as my brother mentioned in John chapter 10, verse 16, that are not of this fall, they will replace those seven Adventists. They will replace us. Yes, sister. Uh, because of the fan, I cannot hear you very well. 
Because of the health message. Yes. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's the foundation, just like in Daniel 1. Now, by the way, this is where I'm, I'm, I'm coming and I'm going to end soon here. When you look at Daniel 1, Daniel 2, I'm talking about the chapters. Daniel 1, Daniel 2, Daniel 3. We see the three angel messages there. Let me explain. First angel's message. Revelation 14. Verse 7, fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come. And the Apostle Paul says, whether we eat or drink, do we all to the what? To the glory of God. First angel's message is to give Him glory. Now when the test, the diet test, which was the health crisis, came to Daniel and his friends in Babylon, Daniel 1. How did they handle the test? Now keep in mind, those four men were not, they were, they were not the only, I should say, they were not the only seven Adventists then. In the house. How did they handle it? Like the psalmist says, I have set the Lord before my face and I shall not be moved. That's how they, under, uh, they handled the crisis. They set the Lord before their face and they could not be moved. They yielded their bodies to God, not to men. They would not defile the body so that they could honor God. Now, moving on to Daniel 2. As a result of those men not defiling their bodies and they have chosen to glorify God instead. What does Daniel 2 represent? Remember, Daniel 1 represents a health message. Glorify God. What does Daniel 2 represent? What happened in Daniel 2? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, right? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He saw a one. An image. You see the word image there? He had, he saw an image. And that image was a com combination, a composition of different metals. And then at the feet of it, you had clay. Different nations, the rise and fall of nations. Right? Rise and fall of nations. Did Nebuchadnezzar and his astrologers, soothsayers, did they understand the, the dream or even the meaning of the dream? Okay, whom did God give understanding wisdom of what the dream of what the dream meant? Why? Because they passed the first test. Because, first angel's message. Now keep in mind, image of the beast, right now. Image is set up. We are being commanded to worship. Now we go to Daniel 3 now. If you pass the first test, then you will understand prophecy, which is Daniel 2. Understanding of the prophetic events. Now Daniel 3 now, you have been already grounded, cemented. Now you will not bow to the image. You will not bow to the image. And that is the third angel's message. Israel then was separated. There was a division in Israel. Three men stood up while the rest of the Israelites bowed. Now, here is my application to this. While the majority of those who were in Israel bowed, only three stood up. I'm going to connect that with John 10, verse 16. Are the sheep that I have which are not of this whole, them also I must bring. There were other sheep in because of those men standing who came to know God. 
They said, truly, just like we read about Naaman yesterday. Naaman said, truly, now I know that there is no other God except in Israel. Nebuchadnezzar confessed, no other God could have saved anyone like this except your God. So those other sheep, well, the majority of seven Adventists bow. But there were other sheep as a result of the testimonies of those men who came to know Jesus as their personal savior. There was a distinction that was made between the wheat and the tares. And that same distinction must be made today, brothers and sisters. Now, in Revelation 11, as you can see in this picture here, and we're going to close here in Revelation 11. As you can see in the scripture here, in the picture here, Revelation 11, verse 1. We are told, and my brother mentioned that, brother Anthony mentioned that this morning. It was given me a reed as unto a rod. And I was told to do what? To measure the temple of God, the altar, and then that worship therein. That's Revelation chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. And the word measure means a people are judged. A people is being judged. Your character, my character is being judged. Now, there is something else that the passage went on to say in verse 2. It was commended to leave the outer court for the Gentiles. Oh, brothers and sisters. Leave the outer court for who? But meanwhile, what was happening to God's people? They were being judged. This is... This is referring to the shaking, brothers and sisters. Those Gentiles now who were in the outer quarter after the harvest from within, the close of probation, the refreshing, those Gentiles in the outer quarter will hear the message, at least some of them. They will come in. They will follow the Lamb in the most holy place as well. They will become martyrs for Jesus Christ. By the way, did you know that many, many and many who will be martyred for Jesus Christ in these last days because of the national Sunday Lord, the mark of the beast, are not Seventh-day Adventists currently? They are not Seventh-day Adventists yet. Many who will be martyred for the faith, for the truth, are not yet in the flock. How do I know this? Can you tell me how? Go ahead, brother. Uh huh. Yes. Amen. There? Yes, 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 yes. I'm familiar with that. Let, let's read it. For those who are watching online, can, can listen to it. Uh, it says in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast. That's the context there. The context is the end time here. Because it says, they had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they live and reign with Christ a thousand years. Now, brothers and sisters, this is not referring to current day Adventists that Jesus. You know why? Here's another reason. Because the few Adventists that are going to be selected for the harvest, they will be sealed. Once you are sealed, you cannot suffer persecution. Well, you can suffer persecution, but not be killed. Do you understand? Right? The few Adventists that are going to be sealed, remember, shaking and then close of probation. The majority of Seventh-day Adventists now are experiencing that close of probation. A few now are experiencing the sealing and the refreshing. They cannot be killed. Then who will be the martyrs then? Who will be the martyrs then? Those 
that have heard the Lord Christ's message and they are coming in. Or the sheep that I have, which are not of this world, they will become the martyrs for Jesus Christ. This is the reason why Sister White says, strive to be among the 144,000. Oh, there's a context there. Strive to be among the 144,000 because that's all we're going to have currently among us. The majority will come from the world. Say that again. Yes. Great multitude? Yes. Strive, brothers and sisters. You and I right now are being measured. We are being shaken. Everybody must experience the shaking. Noah experienced it. But he experienced it inside of the boat. Which represents Jesus Christ. Let us, brothers and sisters, confess all of our sins. Doesn't matter what you have done. Men will continue to condemn your past. But look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Let's have a word of prayer. Loving Father God, which are in heaven, we thank you for the message of the hour. It is a solemn message. It is also a sad message because many of us who are proclaiming to be in the faith will go away just like we've experienced that during the COVID crisis. Father, have mercy upon your people. Help us, Lord, to realize as such an hour as this, and it is very late in the day and in the night, that we need to draw closer to you as we are being measured to see if we will reveal the characteristics of the Lamb of God who take care away the sins of the world. Help your people now to have their eyes open to see our need of you, to see the seriousness of the time that we are living in, and to be ready for the harvest, to be among those who will be harvested, to be ready for the shaking, the shaking that is taking place, and also ultimately to be ready for the refreshing, which is what the church needs now. We ask for forgiveness of all our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. This is just the first, second session for the series.